I was approached by some of the other guys that stayed on. They said, uh, Jones, you did the right thing getting out when you did. Was he Macron? <laughs> I mean, that's almost hilarious what's going on. The French, I know, love the protest. And again, I'm making light of what is quite a serious situation there. We had similar with Trudeau, just completely disconnected. Had you arranged to meet people beforehand through your sort of social network? Walked into work at nine o'clock one morning and 9.05 I'd been fired. Mike, how are you, my friend? I'm very good. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much for having me. Do I call you Mike or do I have to call you yeah, you, call me Mike. No, you, don't Gray. To, you don't have to call me my <laughs> gamer tag as it used to be. No. Oh, is it, it your gamer like name? <laughs> yeah. yeah um, that's I wondered what it, it sounded quintessentially English. I that was Gray. the point. Yeah, that was the point. But the I was a joke because back then it was iPad, iPod, all this and my buddy Morders um uh, another ex uh, army guy he he put eye mortars and i thought that was hilarious so i just put eye or gray and we were just saying i everything back then it was it was a fair few years ago now and was that um how you started your channel was, was yeah. through gaming yeah it was actually world of warships uh back in 2015 when that was launched um i happened to be sort of doing freelance web design and any freelancer will know it's kind of feast or famine so you had a lot of downtime and then a buddy of mine said, hey, this Twitch thing, do you know like people will watch you play games and pay? I was like, what? This is insane. And I started watching and I was like, I can do better than that. So sure enough, I, I started streaming on Twitch and um, yeah, did all, did all right uh, with this game and eventually got hired by the gaming developer whose headquarters were in St. Petersburg. And that's how I ended up in Russia back in 2018. Wow, was that a big move for you? Well, my life had kind of uh, broken down anyway. Uh, my relationship had uh, all gone to pot. And, uh, you know, as the universe sometimes does, it just sort of gives you this opportunity. And uh, I I had like an agency job and this company had hired me full time. But I w walked into work at nine o'clock one morning and 9.05, I'd been fired. Uh, they just sort of said, oh, we don't need you anymore. I, I was just happened to mention it on a stream while I was playing the game. I said, oh, well, I'll get back to streaming now. Uh, because I've just been kicked out of my job. And then someone just said, no, why don't you come work for us? Uh, it started off with a idea of Paris, but then um, I blipped on the radar of the head office and they said, no, no, come work for us here in St. Petersburg. The issue is you have to be, you have to relocate to St. Petersburg. And I thought, well, why not? Why not? And that was about the time of the World Cup as well. So it was an electric atmosphere. It was incredible. Have you bumped into Edward Snowden? uh not quite no I, I think i have his contact actually uh, i think it would only be a phone call or two and yeah uh, i'd love to have a chat with him yeah i mean he really seems like he relocated quite successfully <laughs> yeah 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 um uh, yeah I, I i'm assuming he's pretty happy where he is now uh, i know i am so i, I think he'd uh, he'd have a lot to say as well probably better than being in guantanamo bay or wherever they were going to yeah. to to send him just talk about um russia for a little bit i was very fortunate to have been there oh my gosh probably around 2003 something like that um I was actually on my way to a skiing holiday for christmas and new year in czech republic and uh what i always used to do was when I book these tick these air tickets, try try and get somewhere where I've never been. So mm. I thought, hang on, look, Czech is not that far from Moscow. So why don't I go to Moscow first? Um, we got a train from Moscow to St. Petersburg. That was incredible. These old they're not vintage, but you know, these sort of old style trains, and you get you pull your bed down at night and um it's quite funny. We got on that train and there was a chap there, a Russian chap. He was very nice. And immediately we tried a conversation. He's, he's like, uh, Russian? 
No, 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 no. He said, Do you speak English? No. Nah. And then he just looked at us and said, Portuguese? See, <laughs> seeing, I can't remember. And what it was is my, um, me and the girl I was traveling with at the time, we both worked in Mozambique, um, where the language is Portuguese. And of course, during the um, civil war there and the uprising and da da da, Russia played a big part. Um, and as such, they had their military trainers in country obviously um and they had to learn portuguese which is the second language of uh, or the you know official language of mozambique so that was quite uh that was quite funny but if if i had to bring back one thing other than just the incredibleness to, uh, to be in red square well just uh, amazing but um the thing i remember about st petersburg was it was the most miserably cold I've ever been in my life. And you're talking to someone that's been in the Arctic and the Antarctic. As I say, as a Marine, you'd have uh, done the Arctic training, so you'd know what cold is. It was <laughs> bitter. We stayed in this old, yeah. you know, like a backpacker hostel. I don't know what the building used to be, but it, it was a bit like being in some old school dormitory. There was no heating or anything. Yeah. Um, and I remember looking out the window and seeing this chap sweep in the street. So, you know, council worker, what we'd call them back here, right? Mm. And uh, <laughs> he had a bottle of vodka sticking out of his pocket. Yeah. And then Standard when he, issue. Yeah. And when he went on the underground, w w which is probably the most beautiful underground in the world is it not the this it's one of moscow also has some gorgeous metro stations absolutely breathtaking and the crazy thing was uh, amongst this stunning um you know historic ar architecture every sort of 20 meters on each platform was was an off license <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and You'd said on the train, we were obviously doing the tourist bit, but there'd be some, you know, very respectable sort of middle-aged woman in her business attire and she'd be drinking like gin and tonic at, at, at eight in the morning. I thought, oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. I had a similar experience to that. Mm. Yeah. And St. Petersburg is a gorgeous, a gorgeous city. It was um, quite homely for me being that its reputation in Russia is, is just always grey there. And uh, having come from England, I was like, wow, I feel right at home. Rainy, grey. Uh, and then you get uh, the summer, which is glorious. But one thing I liked about St. Petersburg was the extreme of the seasons. In England, it's almost homogenous. It's like you're not quite sure whether you're in autumn or winter, and they kind of blend together. And then winter kind of becomes spring. You get two weeks of summer. You go, Way! whack out the barbie, drink some beers, and then that's it. That's your summer done, and you're back to autumn and grey and miserable. Whereas in Russia, it's very clearly defined which season is which and then you have that deep winter st petersburg was the first time i had felt wind penetrate through thick jeans and not just through my jeans but to my bones like it, the cold hurt the marrow of my bones and luckily i didn't have to walk too far to work but i was like good god i've never felt uh, that that cold in my like in my actual being as well like uh, like you said, and you've got the wind coming off the Finnish Gulf as well in St. Petersburg. So, yeah, it can be quite brutal. Moscow uh, has a sort of gentler sort of climate and currently absolutely gorgeous and glorious here at the moment. It's, yes, um, I'm just yeah, it's uh, look, looking up because I've got a map there and I love to kind of situate myself where we're talking about in the conversation. Um, we have an added problem here, Mike, in our summers now is, um, I don't know how much we're allowed to say about this, but uh, we get a lot of aeroplanes go over you can say we yeah we, we, people comment in my videos the lack of traces we, of aeroplanes we we don't have an airport in plymouth they shut it down okay yeah we're not really on any sort of essential flight route from what i understand i mean i'm a private yeah. pilot i'm not a commercial pilot but and yet within the space of sort of two hours you can count 30 aeroplanes that have you know, yeah. gone across and whatever it is, folks, that they leave 
in their wake and let's not get into that no. it, it it then forms this porridge in the sky as the day progresses and you yeah. you lose your summer you lose your summer yeah. the 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 only change mike was um during the lockdowns oh yes yeah i recall yeah. Yeah, because there were no me about that because the there were no weren't, weren't. yeah mm -hmm. yeah whereas here on my walk and talks when i'm out and about uh i used to live just south of st petersburg uh, near pulkova airport so i was on a flight path uh with well, Pulkov is a very busy airport, uh, even with these sanctions and the blocking of flights. Obviously, certainly a lot of internal flights coming to and from Moscow, among many other places. And you'd, you'd see them go over quite a lot, but we'd have crystal clean blue skies. Uh, people would often comment, like, wait a minute, how come there's no evidence of aircraft having been in the sky behind you? I was like, I can't comment. I, I don't know. Uh, it just seems to be how it is here in Russia. I'm, I'm often try explain to people when we were kids, you had these beautiful blue skies. Yeah. I mean, rich, like crystal blue. Yeah, I, I, I enjoy them every day. Well, pretty much every day now here in Russia. Good. In the summer. Yeah. Good. I'm pleased for you because we've only seen that since, since my childhood was during the lockdown. And people's minds work in an interesting way that I, I don't think your average person quote unquote in the street, like can make that connection mm. that, whoa, this guy's a completely different color to that, which we've seen for 20 years. This, yeah. this milky white, you know, is even if there aren't, traces in the sky you can still see it's there as this you haze know, mm -hmm. ha haze exactly so uh, so moving swiftly on um congratulations on your channel and all the work you've been doing i know that you're an incredibly um popular youtuber and i've been following your um your story and, and your your um bulletins um well probably round about this the the time the ukraine and russian situation kicked off we are going to talk about you recently having gone missing <laughs> in yeah. ukraine okay <laughs> we'll we'll save that for a bit folks we we will cover it cuz it, yeah <laughs> you um uh, you, my heart was i was just like oh my god i've lost my bloody guess for monday <laughs> <laughs> yeah damn it Reschedule. you swine <laughs> no no genuinely <laughs> my my heart really did crash for a minute because uh, it, w war is is serious isn't it you know yeah. it's incredibly serious and when it goes wrong as it mm. can do um you know for for spectators and interest it's um yeah just i mean just awful i mean we saw gone Gonzalo, Gonzalo Lira, Lira. Go, go, go missing and I think he's missing again is that right yeah second time I reported the first instance uh and indeed the second um the first time was far more Gestapo like than the second I think they learned their lesson there from the PR front and the outcry that it caused uh so then they seemingly kind of tried to follow the book uh and be more uh i don't know civilized about it but even then they couldn't resist sort of just mocking him and like filming his toilet what's that got to do with the price of bread you know with regards to what he was accused of uh, and then these books about putin was it a crime to read about putin in ukraine it seemingly is i don't know but then the fact that that's a crime says a lot <laughs> about that society in my opinion so it was kind of self-incriminating by the way they were like, look, we're filming everything and uh, we're doing this. I was like, yeah, but you're saying a lot of bad things about yourself in the process, especially given that his crime was um, just not towing the official party line uh, or just saying it how he saw it, uh, which wasn't always uh, complimentary to the Kiev regime. How, how did your interest start, Mike? Well, I'll, I'll be absolutely frank and honest. Uh, I was like most people in the West, yeah, even though I'd lived in Russia for a while. I'd heard the odd story maybe about some area in the world called Donbass. I, I don't really know what it was or where it was. 
that quite frankly didn't care to look or look further russian back separatists whatever oh, a bit a bit strange this has kind of blindsided me a bit and the more I, I looked into it not even really asking russians just you know our internet research is very clear uh the path that had gone there and then as i did speak to russians and did more research uh it was quite if we go back from 2014 and crimea uh it was quite apparent how sort of carefully the diplomatic route had been followed with Minsk Accords and then the second Minsk Agreements. It was like Russia was uh, you know, crossing every T and dotting every I, making sure that under international law they had gone by the book. But as we then saw with the sanctions war, I noticed, I was quite amused when I first arrived in Russia to see something like the Mir payment system, because we had Visa, MasterCard, and this thing called Mir. And I asked my wife, what's this Mir? She said, oh, that's the Russian system. And I and it just tweaked in my head then. I was like, interesting that the Russians would develop their own payment system as if they're preparing for something. She said, well, actually, it was after 2014, the first kind of sanctions um, where they Russians suddenly couldn't enjoy cheddar cheese anymore, <laughs> which greatly boosted the Russian cheese uh, industry and farmers. Uh, so I could see that, OK, so Russia kind of got a little taste and realized, OK, if we're going to go down this road, it's going to end up probably magnified to this degree let's put the systems in place which now with retrospect we can see quite clearly happened with both industry economy the central bank had clearly prepared and um, probably not perfectly i don't think you could you could go that far but at least put in sufficient measures to weather the storm that they would face uh, so there was a little clue there uh, that then started to make sense and this was all on the backdrop particularly after Crimea, where P Putin suffered a lot of criticism that he didn't go into Donbass straight away in 2014. Again, I'll say with the benefit of retrospect and hindsight, we could probably say that he knew Russia wasn't ready for what the West would do in reaction to that. So despite um, him suffering that criticism, I think Russians as well are understanding the wisdom behind that patience. It caused a lot of pain obviously for the people of Donbass, they they weren't being backed by Russia as claimed in the BBC. And this was, I think, Jacques Barth, uh, a Swiss intelligence officer, was tasked specifically to find out if Russia was supplying weapons or any form of support uh, and aid to the Donbass region against Ukraine. And he concluded, no, he found no such evidence of any such activity from the Russian Federation, much to the chagrin of the DPR militia and the LPR militia, who were calling out and crying out for this level of support. Their, their heads of uh, government going to the Kremlin, begging uh, for their assistance. Uh, and this is why we've kind of reached this point today as well, uh, where the, the Russia is kind of doing it properly, rather when they could have just funneled weapons in uh, kind of done a proxy war as NATO have done. Uh, they could have done likewise, but they chose to you know, make sure that they had ticked all the boxes prior. I think people do understand the the logic behind it and perhaps the, I'm not going to say the benefit, um, uh, you know, the, the consequences are considered and that's how we've reached this point. So I did all of that research and reached these conclusions. Then it was my YouTube channel started through WhatsApp conversations with friends back home. Where I was laughing uh, that the West would say one thing one week, and then the next week it would flip it on its head, and then we were sort of like, "Wow, this is ridiculous." Then I'd send you know Russian news articles. They'd say, "Oh, is this true?" And I say, "Well, I don't know, but here's what Russians are saying," and then we put the two together. And then I thought, "Well, I can't keep track of all these lies. They're hilarious. I need to share them." So then I thought, oh, "I'll just do like on my lunch break between work, I'll just go through some of the headlines." Maybe also go through the Western headlines and see how they match up. And that's how I, I got going on on YouTube and learning more and more about things. I think it's good credit to people that that they want to know more. Um and that there are there are people out there that are free thinking, that 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 what do we call that? Humanity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was quite telling, was it not, when Russia Today got, you know, smacked pretty quickly in the uh, in the opening days, uh, where Russia Today's licenses were revoked in the UK, I th think in the US, mm. or maybe there was some, uh, they were still allowed. I know people then start, ha start having to use VPN, hence why they were coming to my channel, because then I could give them a synopsis, but also they didn't have to go through all the rigmarole of trying to access uh, Russia Today and other other channels um, like Ria Novosti, uh, etc. And TASS, 
uh, to to get this alternative side. So yeah, there was the hunger, but that was quickly that was quickly blocked by the West, and therefore the first question is, but why? But it was very quite apparent that no, uh, they didn't want any uh, alternative narrative being accessible to these citizens because they know what they've done and they're lying through their teeth and their own archives, the BBC's own archives show this idea of laughing at Putin for saying there's Nazis in Ukraine, whereas the BBC said exactly that <laughs> around yes. 2015. They, they did uh, a whole documentary on it. Absolutely. And then just suddenly it's um, yeah, redacted. It's just suddenly, nope. Um, don't look that way look this way and then the bbc and sky news will show zelensky being escorted by a guy with a tortenkopf symbol on his on his shoulder and is there in plain sight so uh yeah really amusing and these are the kind of chuckles that I, I was having um and it was it was going all right while i was sort of off the radar at ten thousand subscribers fifty thousand, i started to get a bit nervous and then sure enough just after a hundred thousand i started to get my um strikes and bans but NewsGuard in particular, their upset was that I was earning ad revenue. And I don't think it was just that, because in November, I then said uh, that what I'd done is I'd actually put a bulk of that money because I had a job at the time. Uh, so my needs were met. So I was putting the money to one side. And then I, I had this idea to do this humanitarian aid run, but have it funded by the same companies that sanctioned Russia or withdrew from Russia that are advertising on my videos. Amazingly quickly, after NewsGuard's report was published, uh, sure enough, the very same videos that they listed in their article, these were suddenly struck, removed, and then YouTube sent me sort of all sorts of notifications, like we've gone through this, remove this, move this. And it was just eerily fast and accurate how then they then demonetized me as well, which was specifically what NewsGuard uh, disliked uh, the ads were showing. Ironically, the RT documentaries, I had foreseen this and they were demonetized anyway. So the ads they were seeing were actually run by Google. So Google was still profiting off quote, Russian propaganda, <laughs> not me. And I even showed the screenshots proving it afterwards. But the last video was just me on my balcony, literally just discussing the news. I didn't even show any articles or link them. And they said that was hate speech as well for literally just going through the headlines. So yeah, I can see the agenda that's running. Uh, and again, it says way more about the West than it does about Russia. If what I was saying, you know, was, was truly lies or anything like that, uh, I think it'd be a very different case. But uh, this this level of attention I find quite amusing. Mm. But yeah, it's, uh, it does mean I have to kind of reconsider my approach. And I get the message. I'm not welcome on this particular platform. That's fine. It, mm -hmm. I think you're like me, though. You're you're a humanist. You you want the best for everybody. Every time I've done a video on this situation, there's always somebody in the comments is. Oh, you was it your Putin apology or, 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 or uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the first go I'm like, response, dude, I'm 53, I'm too old for all this. Yeah, I love all people, it's that simple. Um, My theory actually is you're ex military as well. Uh, I was just standard British infantry and not for that long. Uh, I did kind of the minimum service and, and got out with the birth of my daughter when I was young. Uh, so I went straight from school into the infantry, and it very. This was back about the time of Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I lost a couple of friends of mine in Afghanistan, and I remember um, being told that you don't fight for your. Uh, back then, it was queen and country, king and country. Now, uh, you fight for the man standing next to you, and that was kind of a big shift from when I had grown up reading Biggles and World War II stories. You know, no, I was doing one's duty and for one's country and all this, and then it had already shifted to. You know, you, you have to protect your buddy and have his back. And then we saw the oil wars, basically people dying for U.S. interests and in oil. And and we knew it in the infantry. Um, we still signed up for it. We were still raring to go at 18, young, dumb and full of spunk. Hmm. Uh, but then when I lost my guys in Afghanistan and I think I was approached by some of the other guys that stayed on. They said, uh, Jones, you did the right thing getting out when you did. Um, a lot of our boys came back in wooden boxes. And was it worth it? Heck no. So I, uh, I was the, fortunately I wasn't in a contact situation or in a deployed to a war zone or anything like that. My training was sufficiently good enough to know the hell and horror uh, that it is. That you know, say what you like about the British Army, but the training is pretty much top notch and is really good at at recreating that. The first thing I learned was I was terrible at identifying where the machine gun was firing from. 
on the hill. <laughs> so wait for the crack and the thump. <laughs> it's like, okay, I still don't know where he is. <laughs> and I'm probably going to get chewed up. Um, but again, and here's my dark sense of humor sort of coming in, uh, as it often does in my YouTube videos, where I chuckle at things you, you shouldn't. Uh, point being, you know that it's not a game. And it's not Call of Duty. And it's never fun. It's never glorious. Uh, you know, you have all these big stories about Wally, the Canadian sniper. Yeah, but what did he do? He ended up running back to Canada because he saw exactly the hell it is and that these guys are getting chewed up. But these are human lives that are being chewed up and ended. Uh, for, for what purpose? Uh, for what end? Really, it's for Lindsey Graham to say Russians are dying. That's the best money we've ever spent. Again, they're just showing themselves for who they are. Uh, the real satanic, dark, twisted individuals uh, to even, I don't know what possessed him to say that in public, certainly on the record. I, I have no idea. But that that kind of shows it for what it is. And at the expense of, you know, best money we've ever spent. Yeah, but it cost how many hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian lives and not just soldiers either. Uh, you know, these, these being thrown away. And then these Russians as well. I've just I've just been sitting with them on the front lines um they're they're having to go through all this for again for what end for what purpose i i was thinking the other day imagine if scotland you know in scotland they don't really like westminster anyway but if westminster started disappearing scottish people do you think the scots would just go oh well we'll just take it no they'd probably break away they'd probably go no no thanks england mm. uh, we've had enough of your rubbish we're we're going our own way and then if uh, westminster then deploys the army and starts shelling the borders of scotland you can very quickly see the analogous situation that might occur there. And we've, we've got that. These people said, no, we don't want any of uh, your nasty rubbish. Thank you very much. We'd rather either be autonomous, or which was the first idea with the Minsk Accords and all this, and that was what they were calling for. Or, or eventually they were pushed to then say, actually, no, we, we want to be part of the Russian Federation. I appreciate that. But as you say, yeah, uh, I'm more keen to try and alleviate uh, the suffering that my my country uh, or the elites of my country are perpetuating in this region at the expense of uh, human lives. They have such massive cognitive dissonance, don't they, about the reality of what of what they do. I wonder what would happen if you said, look, OK, look, you you can unleash this hell on on Russian people or people in the Donbass. But here's the thing. In the interest of of righteousness, the same hell is going to be released on you on where you live. Look at um, Bakhmut; it's leveled, it's leveled yeah. to to worse than Hiroshima, or on the same extent. You get your armchair warriors sat miles and miles away, only knowing the mainstream media narrative, and. And willing to support, as you said, this 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 satanic psychopathy. Um, I don't know. Is that too much Call of Duty? Yeah, I don't know if it's just laziness as well. It's like, um, just tell me what to think. Uh, this is what people want. And I, I get it. That's easier rather than actually thinking for yourself and going looking and daring to challenge. We had the the health scare as well, which was a good forerunner and really showed certain people who just really, they, they don't want to think for themselves. They just want to do what they're told. Uh, they're paying the price, sadly. Again, human lives from these psychopaths. Uh, Bill Gates being one of them. Sorry, uh, I'm going to come out and say it. But yeah, quite clearly one of these that have profited from it. And very very happy uh, to cause suffering uh, suffering and misery on people. He's not the only one, of course. These um, elites, again, have been happy to unleash this on their own populations. They've been happy to unleash sanctions and then have it blow back in their face. Well, they're all right. Boris Johnson isn't suffering. Sunak isn't suffering. Biden certainly isn't suffering. Everyone else is, but, well, don't worry about the plebs uh, and all that. And uh, I hate to say it, but the Russian people aren't suffering, uh, you know, uh, to the, certainly not to the same degree as the Western people. The cost of living here is slightly elevated, of course, with uh, inflation and things like this. But um, you know, nothing, nothing from some of the horror stories I'm hearing coming out of the UK. So yeah, complete. Uh, Putin himself has said that you know it's very, it's becoming more and more apparent to even the West's own citizens just how disconnected the elites are to their people and their wishes. We see Macron 
<laughs> I mean, that's almost hilarious what's going on. The French, I know, love to protest. And again, I'm making light of what is quite a serious situation there. We had similar with Trudeau, just completely disconnected, just, uh, just a pantomime. Uh, and these are supposed to be these venerated world leaders. Annalena Baerbock talking absolute rubbish, and especially in Beijing as well. It's like, oh, you want to say that stuff to the Chinese? Can you, okay. can you remind us what she said, Mike, for those that... Oh, yeah, she was um, She was basically like warning, if I recall correctly, because a lot's happened since then, I think she was telling China what to do, saying that, you know, you can't back Russia and then trying to lecture them on Taiwan. And it was like, <laughs> what? Okay. This is the same beer book that said that uh, Russia had done a 360 degree turn on its position or something it was like she's clearly not the sharpest tool in the shed and, and she's effectively declared war on russia in germany's name saying that we are fighting a war against russia I said, uh, <laughs> you don't really woman you don't understand the like international legal implications of your words here as the foreign minister of germany and i single her out she's just one of the whole cast of uh, clowns that i get to chuckle at uh well used to get to chuckle at on youtube do you think um I I truly believe it's changing. My my I don't want to say my mission and it's nothing about that, but the way that I choose to live is enlightening people. There is a very special point you can get to in your life where you see it all and you understand it all. You might not know. I mean you're coming out with some names and that I'm just blissfully unaware, Michael, as long as because I don't watch, you know, I just do my channel find out what I need to know to do, say, this video. Um, yeah. you, you, um, people say to me all the time, Chris, do you see what's up? I was like, you know, I don't watch telly. <laughs> you know, you I, li I lived off grid. I lived you off know. grid for five years uh, and was the happiest I've ever been because I didn't read the news. I, I just had my caravan in the woods, got up with the sun, hunted my uh, lunch and dinner for that day, got back, uh, sawed some wood, chopped some wood up, um, yeah, built built some uh, outbuildings and stuff, uh, helped some neighbors with renovations and things like that. Yeah, I, I completely understand. Mm -hmm. um, and then then I kind of got back into plugging into the matrix again. So I, I think that enables me to to have that kind of uh, compartmentalization where it's like I see this going on, but I'm not caught up in it. Uh, no, I know good. it can give you a lot of stress and fear, and that's its intention. Yeah. to keep you in this state of oh my god oh my god oh my god no it's hence why i can laugh about a lot of it uh, uh despite yeah some of the things uh you end up I seeing. just i just think going back to your point about these you know deluded people is they're only where they are because they own the their club owns the media yeah they're in with the club and that's why i think they can say things like uh, i just said about lindsey graham they say these are like ridiculous things uh jungle joseph burrell him coming out with these really bizarre, almost hallucinogenic uh, tropes. I think they they say that in the full knowledge that what are you going to do? What is anyone going to say? Not even the population is going to rise up. You know, we we got it all under control. I'm a god, untouchable. I think they're on a dodgy wicket because, like I say, I wouldn't do what I do um, if I didn't feel that we want you know. As, as humanity we've won this everything goes in cycles we've clearly been in a very dark one for a considerable mm. amount of time now and and so many people are wise to it so many people are wise to it and once they make that connection that ah hang on if i literally just turn off that mainstream media these people lose their power they they you know no one's going to hear what Bill Gates is saying and what his crazy machinations and his very bizarre thinking are. And, and I see that happening more and more every day. It, it's I think we still got to get across to people that even if you tune into the alternative media, you've got to stop the fear based narrative and you've got to s start supporting love highest form, oh, yeah highest form of vibration yeah um, absolutely because otherwise these leeches they still got you folks their thing they but, do is they create yeah. fear to control you um so 
Yes. Does that make sense, Mike? Um, Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. First of all, this this dis- uh, discrimination, these creating divisions between people. Okay, you're this, you're that, you're whatever. No, I'm not. I'm a human being. I'm nothing, you know, nothing more, nothing less. It's don't label me, don't give me these identities. And then we're seeing all this bickering and distraction, trying to argue about, you know, men, women, parent one, two, three, B, C, I don't know. Is you're not you're not paying attention to what matters, and that's the point mm-hmm. of it all. And then we get down the road where we can end up with these situations like in Donbass. Oh, you're you're a Russian, you're a Ukrainian, uh, you know, you're this side, you're that side, you're your language the the words that come out of your mouth suddenly this is forbidden and therefore you deserve death uh for this or not even that just your parents were and we've we've had this theme before in a certain country in europe uh which uh gone this way and I, you said about these satanic forces i believe yeah they really are feeding off the misery and suffering certainly in this region once again and they they really get off on it it seems uh, and as i've said to the soldiers on the front line uh, they said you're really brave to be here I said, no, it's not bravery. And they said, well, what is it then? I was like, that's a really good question. I had to really go inside myself. And I said, actually, it's anger. Anger is why I'm here. Anger that my, the betrayal of my country, but more importantly, my grandfather and what he fought for and the ideals he had and how he's, he and people like him have been sold out. Uh, and that, yeah, that's, that's kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing, why I'm there and why I, uh, why I'm on the side that I'm on. I spent a day embedded with a Christian Orthodox battalion, uh, part of a whole regiment of volunteers. And I'm not particularly religious uh, in truth, but I was amazed. Uh, It was refreshing to see people celebrating their beliefs, abiding by a code. You'll agree with me for an infantry unit to um, successfully, well, seemingly successfully ban swearing, I thought was an excellent, um, uh, excellent display of discipline. Uh, with it. I didn't hear any cuss words while I was there <laughs> amongst them. And that's quite, quite an achievement, I think, for an infantry unit um, so, there. Mike, just let's talk some basics here. How, how, how did you get over there? Obviously, you're coming um from st petersburg is there a place you fly to no i drove in the buhanka uh the the soviet classic van uh that i was gifted uh on my first trip to donbass uh Uh, a friend of mine i asked if he had one for sale and he said well come to my office tomorrow uh about 1 p.m turned up there and there's a brand new uh buhanka a 1960s design (laughs) still true to it uh, and he said, there you go, that's yours to to do these humanitarian runs. And I've put 25,000 kilometers on her since, yeah, November. That's incredible. And how is it then? Is there a particular place you enter the border so that you can avoid immediate trouble? Or, or, or is there... Like no, good- not really. You, there's a couple of border crossings you can go through. Uh, there's the Donetsk in Russia as well. I think we call it Little Donetsk. Uh, there's a border point there, Rostov. Incidentally, these are questions the FBI asked about me uh, to a guy from America who came to visit. We took him to Donbass, or rather John Mark Dugan did. When he got back, uh, the FBI pulled him to one side and was asking him questions about me. He only met me for an hour. And they're asking, what vehicle did I drive? Uh, what border points did I cross at? Uh, what about my family in the UK? How did I pay money to my kids there? I thought, that's interesting. The US government quizzing about a UK citizen uh very very odd <laughs> but you're not working for them are you chris <laughs> if i was mate I, could they pay <laughs> could you pay me something please well yeah hopefully they pay better than being a kremlin shill because i still haven't received my uh paycheck i'll tell you what mate I'll, i wouldn't have time <laughs> to work for the cia or the fb because i'm i'm too busy in my job with the illuminati <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 with klaus schwab <laughs> I remember that when I'm cleaning my garage out on my own, cussing and swearing because it's the last thing you want to do on a Sunday. And you know, unfortunately, folks, I can't pay someone to do to do. Yeah. I can't do all this shit jobs. I'm got to do it all myself. Um, yes. So you get there. Um, you drive in. Had you arranged to meet people? beforehand through your sort of social network or online network 
Uh, yeah, we have a context um, built up through our previous visits there. Um, initially, we transported donations from one organization in Moscow to another organization in Mariupol. And then through then, we've uh, found other causes, people, families, uh, people in the administration as well that can help us and point us towards um, good causes. Like the second run was I had this idea to deliver presents to orphanages for Western Christmas, not Russian Orthodox Christmas. Uh, and we met uh, um, Dianego. Um, he was a great guy. He was formerly the foreign minister of the LPR, but he knew all the uh, all the right people to go to. So then, um, yeah, we built up this itinerary of uh, these visits to these different orphanages where we took these presents to. So yeah, that, that's kind of kind of make it up on the fly if you like. You kind of on each each trip, you then find something to do on the next trip. And then the amount of support from my audience as well. Uh, as I said, I, init I initially had been putting just YouTube ad revenue to fund this. But then, of course, people in the West wanted to get on. So then I had this kind of positive feedback loop almost. So where I then posted the videos of the trip I did, people would then contribute, which would fund the next trip. And again, you, you know, it carries on rolling. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something I communicate to these places and people that, hey, a lot of this assistance has actually been funded by people in the West. You are not alone. There are people who do understand the truth and do stand by your side. And it's, don't think for one minute, uh, you know, that these governments represent these people. Absolutely not. No way. Is it easy to get across the border? Uh, I usually have a little uh, little chat with my FSB friends. Oh, right. which we have actually become quite friendly i was drinking cognac with them at 1 a.m once <laughs> was, don't um, like, don't uh, don't compromise anyone for god's sake no no of course <laughs> but, no, no, no. Uh, no they they put us up in what i called the donetsk ritz uh the first the first occasion uh it was definitely not the ritz it was uh, quite an amusingly soviet uh accommodation uh no yeah i i generally have some scrutiny because i'm still a british uh passport holder uh you know it's completely understandable but they're they're amazing guys they're really chill uh again as if you've been like a sentry or anything like that you know someone's just got to tick some boxes do their job um so you just you know wait it out don't give them grief they won't give you grief uh they're generally really chill guys they're really really good to get on with and what is the physical landscape like when you when you cross that border do you immediately know oh my god i'm in a war zone or is it kind of no you, you feel like you've gone back in time as soon as i cross the border it's like i've gone back to yeah the soviet union because of the chronic lack of investment that this region had when it was under ukraine's control uh they just relied on this the existing soviet uh, infrastructure even the old trams and things and the, uh, the old pylons and everything uh, as we saw with Azovstal, you know the only reason they could hold out so long was how well built the soviet uh, plant was and all the tunnels that had been put in uh, so that's that's the first thing you notice. Then all the larders, uh, the old knee, uh, yeah, Nevers, old little larders, Putin and Randy Muscoviches. So these again, still people that haven't, they're on their way to, of course, but they aren't quite of that consumerist throwaway culture. This is something that you repair and you keep running and um, you make do, make do and mend, as we used to say in England back in the day, mm. uh, just before I was born, actually. But anyway, it, it was a hangover that I was brought up with, and that was what they're they're doing now. Uh, the roads were were I say work for the most part. They're beautiful. They're just asphalt ribbons now, gorgeous to go through. But they certainly were pretty terrible shape, uh, and they still are towards the front lines, uh, of course. But amazing work is being done to improve them. So actually, uh, for the most part um it's a great standard of living uh, better than i had in the uk when i'm there eating tuna steaks and uh, having great great food and great life there uh, when you get to donetsk uh, it was just usually with the background rumble of uh, artillery uh, which was kind of just like thunder it becomes thunder in the background to you but this ever constant sort of shelling going on and excuse me when Mike, when do you start to see signs that of 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 the war? How does it work? Do you come across like checkpoints and they want to stop and check your ID, or or do you see yeah, buildings between... that are smashed up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when uh, when you get to places like Lugansk, which were safe, yeah, you'll come across these checkpoints um, that get, of course, more frequent as you get closer to to the front lines and the border. Um, 
when you get to Donetsk, yeah, you'll find just buildings blown apart and the remnants and remains there collapsed uh, around you. And uh, then when you head to places like Severodonetsk, it's apocalyptic. Uh, Rubezhnoye is, again, another one. We were near Ugladar, um, uh, Volovaha, I think it was, another place. You you mentioned about Bakhmut being almost erased. Uh, in Makivka, which is a district of Donetsk, that's similar to Bakhmut. That's been fought over for years. That's been leveled almost, just... It's a hellscape uh, when you get to certain places. Mariupol was. Uh, it's getting much better, and they're doing very uh, quick reconstruction there. But yeah, think you know, think worst nightmare, apocalyptic levels of just burnt out rubble. Where are the where where are the refugees going? Um, quite quite a few to Russia, in fact. Uh, but they talked a lot about yeah, some of uh, these refugees getting out. Um, for the main most part. Um, Russia, as we saw with Mariupol, had these or tried to set up these humanitarian corridors to shuttle people out and get them to the district of the Russian Federation. Even in Kherson, people were issued certificates. So if you had property in these regions, you could get a certificate and get uh, a free property somewhere else in the Russian Federation. Uh, They try and relocate you that way, uh, which is as a lot of people took up um and uh, did a like a fast track passport system as well so there are all the measures in place to do their best to get people to move out but again as people understand especially older people just they've lived there they've seen it all and they're kind of just gonna let it happen around them unfortunately and how did you meet john mark dugan what's that what's that connection uh he reached out to me uh, he thought I was a, a pompous ass because I told him to book a schedule in my Calendly meeting <laughs> calendar. <laughs> uh, and this was around sort of late October. Uh, he'd noticed what I was doing. I noticed I was in St. Petersburg and wanted to reach out. And I think it was, yeah, when I said in a video that I planned to go to Donbass, uh, he'd, he'd been there numerous times before. So he wanted to join forces with me. So I reached out and that was about, um, yeah, about November time. Uh, and that's how we how, that's how we linked up and got together. And he was uh, clearly quite worried about you recently. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure how I came. A- oh, that was right. One of my team um, sent me a message, um, and he said you'd gone missing. And like I say, my heart just dropped because you you do think the worst. Um, was that just you were off comms, off radar for a bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, now it's understandable how it got to where it got to because that day we was we were under the impression we were doing a day trip to Solidar uh, to get there, see the situation. Uh, Wagner had taken it quite a while ago, so it had been demined um, and cleared. We thought, but of course, activity on this front line as um, well was hotting up then. So this was the first day I hadn't driven the Buhanka because I'd complained the day before, like, damn, these roads are terrible. I'm exhausted by the time we get to the location. Uh, I'd I'd prefer if I can be in the car as a passenger and point the camera out the window, do all these things I can't do when I'm wrestling with the gears and all the systems of the Buhanka. Uh, it really is a multi-gym <laughs> when you're driving this thing and all the levers are in strange places. Uh, so the, my wish came true. But it then meant, well, we were dropped off about 3 p.m. And we were just told that the request had been put up the chain of commands uh, for approval uh, for us to get there and also a transport to come and pick us up and take us on further. Uh, what we didn't know is that due to the situation, you could then only go under the cover of darkness. We were sitting there 3 p.m. Like, oh, great. Well, it doesn't get dark till 10. As we approached uh, this, it was about south of Bakhmut, uh, we were told we had to switch everything off on the phone. Airplane mode, disable GPS, because Ukraine is tracking these SIM cards. And if they identify Russian or foreign ones, they'll then strike at that location as best they can. Uh, so that was one one question to me was, what are you filming on? If it's your phone, then you need to do all this stuff. I have a, a DJI pocket that I also use. Uh, so that was why we were completely dark uh, and went off. So uh, our contacts, of course, 
as we discussed before we left at 9 a.m., expecting us back in the evening. So, yeah, John then um, didn't hear from us. Our, our, the guy that dropped us off, he waited about a couple of hours, but he left at 5 p.m., so it's point of no return there. So uh, we had to wait. Darkness came along, no transport arrived because the action had got so bad that even the general of the unit we were uh, hosted by, embedded with, he'd had to be evacuated uh, pretty pronto out of this um, area so we fell down the list of priorities as it, you know as one can expect so we were treated to an evening in the basement of uh, an unfinished building it wasn't destroyed or bombed it was just one of these uncompleted projects uh, on the front lines overlooking Bakhmut, uh, which was surprisingly comfortable they had a little space heater in there they put some sort of silver um, reflective stuff around the walls so it wasn't like being in a cave They'd uh, injected all that expanding foam under the cracks so that uh, it was kind of airtight. Even had a little gym in there, a little speaker going on, a nice book collection and all this. This was kind of staging post for R&R so the units would rotate through. Uh, so we were close, but not right on the front lines. Uh, and then, of course, the next morning, uh, the guy came from Donetsk and uh, picked us up sort of late afternoon. So it was a good 24 hours that we were completely uh, off comms. But despite the artillery going off around inbound and outbound it, you know we weren't really in a uh, terrible danger or anything it was just that i think john was a bit too quick uh and he went public probably a bit sooner than he should have done because it did look a little bit bad for the guys who were looking after us to then uh, on some of these big channels like Slavyangrad, bless them uh, which is also read by a lot of Russians to then put out that I'm missing when you know my my guy had just dropped me off and he was like what the hell the next day he's driving getting messages from these people like what the hell happened to these guys he's like I'm driving them back now what the hell so yeah he got a a bit of shtick for that um, is it the the previous day we had been sort of uh, we were trying to get an interview this was with the Orthodox Christian relig- um, battalion. We were trying to get to the front line to interview one of the guys who was literally in the trenches and we came under rocket fire uh as we were approaching had to get back so i think because i told john that he was kind of worried that i'd don't know driven the bohanka over an anti-tank mine or something like that so i get why john panicked a little bit <laughs> is 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 there a hit list i've heard these words associated with you or is that all just yeah. some yeah, there is, unfortunately. CIA backed, um, even with Langley, Virginia, as its address, uh, Miratvoritz. It's called Miratvoritz.center. Uh, they post pictures of dead Russians um, on the on the homepage, and they even have young children, teenagers, uh, journalists, um, who, who are listed there. They'll dox you, so they'll post all your information, your address, uh, Faina Savankova, she is. She was a young um, writer, about 12 years old, 13, when she was first put on this hit list. It's the hit list that Daria Dugana was on, and then they marked liquidated uh, when she was murdered. Same with Tatarsky as well being another one. I think Roger Waters is on there as well, Pink Floyd. Uh, I think Tucker Carlson <laughs> was added there, along with Jackson Hinkle, among others. But I, I earned my place there not long ago. So, yeah, I've been put on this Ukrainian hit list uh, where, yeah, they'll uh, mark you for death. And then, uh, yeah. Talking of the old uh, internet then, I've noticed on Twitter lately, it all seems to have gone to bloody ratchet. It, it, you're getting shown photos of, I think it's like both Russian and Ukrainian, depending on who the Twitter poster is. Mm. And they're showing them, you know, with a drone like hovering overhead. Oh, yeah. And you see the person in the trench move a little bit. And then you see them like look up and they realize there's a drone. I mean, without getting too graphic, folks, if you're sensitive, just don't listen for uh, 20 seconds. But, you know, this guy looks up, the drone comes down, he bloody catches it and throws it away. Um, but too late. And. Um, I'm not sure what I can say here, but let's just say he realizes, you know, the old Grim Reaper is very close at that point and he picks up his own rifle and uh, you know, yeah. um, I think you can work out what I'm talking about, folks. Um, but there are all these like crappy like bot profiles, if you're not, you know, these just some uh, random obscure 
emblem or something. I just didn't know if, if you might have some insight into that, Mike. It, 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 it again, anyone commenting on that, like, hey, yeah, 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 oh, just, it's just all a bit sad, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is, and it's actually quite terrifying. You know, when I think back to my training, we were, yeah, you know, we were focused on, you know, stag looking out in front of you. It wasn't really a consideration to look above, and that I, I obviously I see similar footage on Russian channels, and um, no, I'm not inclined to celebrate that because I find that deeply, deeply terrifying. This is a problem, though, isn't it? War. It it it's it's just mm. playing on young playing on young people's naivety and and vulnerability and stupidity and, and uh, all from the safety of their keyboards. Um, yeah, back wherever they are in the world, they'll never have to live with the consequences. The I doubt they consider that's a husband, father, son, brother, or anything like that. Unfortunately, they, on this trip, I lost my friend Alexei Oblasov. Uh, he died. He succumbed to his wounds um after i think it was about 19 days in a coma i met him on my first two trips and this was a guy who he could have had a cushy press job but as you said it's my this is my homeland uh, i want to be on the front lines and um, we tried to convince him you know like you're like using a microscope to smash a nail in because uh, he was really good with um with um mechanics and electronics and things so he had a better role he could have fulfilled in our opinion but there was no convincing him he was 47 years old and uh and anyone else can surely relate you know if if your if your home neighbors friends family are suffering being disappeared by the government and you decide to take a stand and then they send the army at you well you're probably going to pick up a gun and you're probably going to want to join the boys who are in the front lines. And sadly, there's a high risk that you won't come home. And unfortunately, in Alexei's case, he was one of them that uh, lost his life. And the sad thing is, looking at it from a holistic perspective, none of them know who they're really fighting for. No, you know? this is where I mean the very localized view. This was this is their feeling. Well, what else am I supposed to do? Just what sit at home or? pretend it's not happening it's on their doorstep this is it's, the difference the keyboard warriors on reddit and the reddit battalion uh they what do they do early on they flew over there like well hey yeah let's let's get stuck in and then soon realized that no it's a meat grinder as yeah. sort of said and then the, they trotted off back home um some of them lost a few bits of themselves along the way and i can't say i have much sympathy for the war tourists who did that and uh, these mercenaries but uh, you know i'll give them benefit of the doubt that they succumbed to propaganda they learned the hard way but they had that luxury of being able to jog on home whereas these guys it is their homes that are under under fire and under attack and they're doing what the only thing they feel they can do mm. to be um, to have any self-respect it's a bit like uh, britain in the first world war and the second world war you're given a feather if you're on the bus mm. as a coward uh, i think yeah that's pretty much the same situation that we see for these people it it's the big club folks they control everything until you start to see it this mm -hmm. is what we're giving to our kids until you understand learn, you know the, the, the uh, how finance work well you don't even mm. it, you don't have to get it to any di deep level understand the uh, ancient european banking aristocracy mm. rather and yeah and it's it, my my thing mike is you know, you're a you're a lovely bloke, clearly. If I walked into a bar, me and you'd be chatting within five minutes, swapping yeah. email addresses, friends for life, folks. You know, if there's a Russian chap next to us, he's gonna be in the conversation. We're gonna be fascinated to meet him, learn about his homeland, you know. Etc. Likewise with the Ukrainian. I've done if, it with Ukrainian. If a Ukrainian well. walks in that door, He's just the same, you, you, you know, like I recently um, I ran a race in the Sahara. There was 1,180 people entered. And, uh, you know, do you think anyone there had any hate for the two Russian competitors? You know, or I don't I don't remember off the top of my head if there were any Ukrainians, but no, of course not. We're, we're there for a beautiful experience. It's called life. You get mm -hmm. one crack at it. In, well, certainly in this set of molecules, 
There's mm. no time for hate, no time for it. And the sadness is that this hate is all being controlled. In fact, yeah, I didn't hear any um, any such dark things. It was kind of this sort of um, sad acceptance of the situation as it is. Um, respect for the enemy, which is healthy and, and wise to keep there. But yeah, just this understanding that even even their enemy is almost a puppet and being forced to do what it's doing yes when you look back at the history i mean even just as far back as the second world war and you you see mm. it all starts to get complicated when you think that um ukraine had like the whole regiments mm -hmm. working along alongside the germans and i'm not judging if I, i'm i'm it was documented not, not, fact, you in know, history. Yeah, and then you could see that it was the, you know, the the red peril from the east that everyone was was and 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 then you fast forward. Even though, ironically, it probably would be in Ukraine's interest to exploit this big brother on the east and all the the trade deals that they could do and really bump their their you know standard of living economy whatever we're going to call it but then of course you've always got the thing yeah we we want to wear levi jeans and drink coca-cola mm. <laughs> i'm just yeah have mcdonald's yeah i'm mm. i'm i'm being uh silly here but that's what the yeah. old jokes were wasn't it back in um was it like alexi sale in the young ones oh symbol of free west coca-cola and you can yeah. see that you know why people felt that um hey you know we've got a president here and he just doesn't want to throw us completely in with europe he's saying that actually there might be someone over the other border that could really do us a lot better um complicate mike it's complicated i'm so yeah. grateful you've come on the show i just want to leave uh, with just say one thing friends i hope you got from this this is a podcast about love, a love of humanity and wanting it. If all you got from this is like, I take a side or Mike to, I, I, um, I'd be a bit disappointed, but no doubt that, that, that's the, the, the notion of, uh, oh, that's a side effect of, uh, you know, a very strong mainstream media and, bit of indoctrination there along along the way especially for maybe those of us been in the military um mm. but let's just get to a point of love folks mike absolutely brilliant stay on the line just so i can um, um thank you properly but thanks for giving us your time glad you made it back out of your uh your uh communication silence <laughs> um thank you very much Since and uh pleasure. As a you know, you're always welcome to come back on the show, and uh, um, and I, and I look forward to that. I'd be delighted to. Thanks, Chris. Friends at home, massive love to you as always. If you could like and subscribe, it'd be really, really kind of you. Click the notification bell because apparently these seem to get turned off again. Um, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>